before we, we get to Breaking Bad, in between the feature scripts and Breaking Bad, there was a show called The X-Files. Sure. And Chris Carter talked about a, um, a life-changing meeting that he had with you in a recent interview. Now, maybe that's his perspective of it. Did you uh, use those words? Wow. If I have it in quotes. <laughs> so Life-changing for me. That's yeah, yeah, well. Um, it was, maybe that's what he meant. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but he said that he had read Wilder Napalm and yes. that he wanted to meet with you. Yes. And um, do you recall anything about that meeting, what you might have done in the room that really kind of sealed it for her? Yes, I can tell you exactly. I remember it very well. I was not there to get a job. And I was therefore very much at ease. I, I was a big fan of the X Files. Uh, I had been a fan of it since the first episode had aired. And this, when I had this meeting with, with him, it was probably uh, late, late ish season two, which, which would put it sometime around maybe November, October, November of 1993. No, actually, probably early 94. Anyway, the show had been on the air for about uh, a year and a half. And uh, it was already becoming, it was not yet the hit that it would grow to be, grow to become, but it was already. And the cult following. It was already, already had the cult following. Uh, and I was a fan of it, as I say, right from the get go. And I was living in Virginia at the time. I was writing movie scripts, uh, uh, and only movie scripts at the time, and living in Virginia. And uh, I was not a snob about TV, but I just, I had a house in Virginia, I had a girlfriend back there, I had family, I had you know, reasons to be in Virginia. And the only thing I knew about television at the time was that uh, when you wrote for it, you needed to be present in the writer's room with the other writers. And, and typically that meant Los Angeles, if, if not New York City. And I was in uh, way out in the backwoods of Virginia uh, and, uh, and liking it there. But I was out here for a movie meeting that uh, I, I had high hopes for that, that went nowhere. But uh, I had told my... Uh, feature agent, uh, I had said to her on the phone one day talking movie business, I said, by the way, apropos of nothing, but have you seen this new show called The X-Files? It's really, really good, and uh, I really like it. And she said, well, as luck would have it, I am related by marriage to the guy who created it, <laughs> and, uh, and would you like to meet him? And I said, absolutely, that would be great. Uh, and I went in to that meeting not intending to pitch him anything. I just wanted to shake the hand of this man who I thought was doing an excellent job creating a TV show that I love very much. And so I went in very, uh, I was, there was a, 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 a distinct lack of nervousness on my part because I was not trying to get a job. Uh, and I did not know, I only found out later, he had read a, a movie script of mine. Uh, at least that's the way I remember it. I, I, that was not uh, on the forefront of my thinking at that point. I, uh, I didn't realize, in other words, he was looking for writers. And, and I, I sat down and, and I thought, well, you just, I just want to shake this guy's hand. And he, and he said, do you have any ideas? And I was like, well, yeah. And oddly enough, the night before, I had, uh, this, sound, <laughs> this sounds kind of disingenuous, like I, like I really would did have, pulled, have something in my back pocket. I really didn't. But the night before in the, at the Sofitel on uh, Beverly there, where they, had, they put, would put me up, I was watching TV and I was looking at my shadow on the wall next to me that the TV was casting because I had the rest of the lights in the hotel room off. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be creepy if my shadow started to move independently of me? And that was pretty much all I said to him. And he, you know, that old, <laughs> <laughs> that old, uh, what was the old, uh, the old uh, fable, the old children's book, Stone Soup, you know, where, where the, the guy, you know, he, you guys know Stone Soup, right? You put the rock in the, you get all the villagers, you, the, the guy is going around begging for food and, and the soldier back from the war, nobody will give him any food in the village, so he gets his stew pot out and he puts, gets water boiling and he puts stones in it. It's like, ooh, this is going to be good. And all the villagers come around him and they say, what the hell are you doing? He says, I'm making stone soup. And like, what are you kidding? You know, it would be really good if you had some, like, uh, onions to put in. Oh, I got some onions, and some guy goes, puts onions. Oh, you, would, you know what else would be good? A little bit of celery. Stone soup is good with celery. And someone else, some villager brings celery, and then he said, you know, chicken. Chicken is good with stone soup. <laughs> so in stone soup fashion, uh, I think probably all I did say in that meeting was, hey, what if my shadow started moving? And then Chris, and then probably Howard Gordon, and some of the other folks who were on staff at the time said, hey, and then what if this happened? What if that happened? And then it was became very much a group effort very quickly. And they said, would you like to write a freelance episode of this? And I said, 
what does that mean? I mean, how, what, that, you know, I mean, I, mean I, I knew what it meant, but I mean, what, what You've kind had of. You've kind of a charmed life, I, haven't you? I, very often these things, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's a, like, uh, like, almost like Kramer on Seinfeld. <laughs> it's, it's based on falling ass backward into good luck. Yeah, I, I've been, I've been very, I got very you lucky. are, so there's something well, to that. I, I got, I got very lucky in the, in the get-go. I really did. I, I, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But if they hadn't liked your work, you wouldn't have been there. So there is, there is the combination of, of talent and timing. Well, I, you know, I, I do believe we all pay our dues. Some people are lucky to not have to pay them in advance. But you pay them sooner or you pay them later at some point. And, uh, but I, I, I got lucky pretty early. I was, I was very fortunate. So Soft Light became your first episode that, that you wrote for the X-Files. And you were not on staff yet. You were, you were right. still freelancing. And again, in this article, which could, could be completely wrong, uh, but this is the article that I had read with Chris Carter, he talked about the fact that the draft that you turned in would have cost five times the budget oh, that yeah. they had. Oh, right, <laughs> yeah. I had no concept. I was so naive that I thought when it's the legend came up, the little Chiron at the bottom, and it said, you know, Salt Lake City, Utah, you know, on the X-Files, I thought they really went there and shot that. I was, <laughs> I was that, I hate to admit, I was that naive about the, the, the realities of television production. I, I don't, can't even believe that saying that now, but I'm not even kidding. <laughs> but uh, that initial draft I wrote probably would have cost 15 to 20 million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> what was in it? <laughs> it, it had, uh, well, the, the, the shadow, for instance, moved independently right. of, the, of the main character who, was, who wound up in the finished episode played by Tony Shalhoub. In the original version, he moves independently. I didn't realize that would have to be rotoscoped and, and hand animated or I don't know how they would have done it to this I'm not sure how to this day there's probably a couple different ways to do it but it would have been some animation process and there was some big fourth act set piece where the shadow grows bigger and bigger and everything starts disappearing into it black hole like and the whole lab is being is being upended and crushed and sucked into it and <laughs> Mulder's hanging from a light fixture and all this crazy shit that uh, you know it would have been a something you could do on a on a fairly decent budgeted feature, but you certainly could do it on, on the X-Files. And we had a lot of money on that show, but, but we couldn't have done this. So, so yeah. you were rewritten on that episode for budgetary reasons? I, well, no, not just budgetary reasons. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, I, there was quite a bit I didn't know, you know, in terms of, you know, I'd probably, as, as big a fan as I was of the X-Files, I don't, the, my first time out, I certainly did not I've never read that script since I wrote it. I'd be interesting to go back to that first draft. I'm sure the voices of the characters were, were, they were hopefully in the ballpark, but they were not Mulder and Scully as Chris knew it. And, and there was rewriting that had to be done to make it an X-File. And then there was rewriting that had to be done to make it uh, financially feasible and doable. When, when I watched it uh, recently, I was struck by the fact that when the show began, it was really much more case of the week and it felt like more like a traditional network episodic. Mm -hmm. And as the show went on, it got quirkier and it got more into serialized storytelling. Yeah. So if you look at it within the, the timeline of television, it is almost the, the bridge between the TV that came before it and the more serialized storytelling that came after it. It was an interesting hybridization of a TV show. It was very, we had episodic episodes. We had the Monster of the Week, which, which I, specialized in and then we had uh, the the mythology episodes which were more serialized and it was an interesting hybrid of a TV show and and uh, I can't think of too many other examples of a show that used that hybrid hybridized structure well at the time Fox wasn't quite a network the way CBS and ABC they, they were more the equivalent of what a cable network would be now so maybe they had a little bit more latitude to do they were still the newest network at the time and yeah I suppose they could they were free to you know, the the bigger you grow, the more you have to lose. The more conservative you you become in your in your in your uh, risk taking, I suppose. And 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 that maybe could be said about them. Um, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Because I, I I mean, there's definitely an evolution over the course of it. And even the later episodes that you wrote, I saw more of your humor and your voice coming through once you became a staff writer and you got to know the process better. Right. How, did, how did that change writing for the show versus in the beginning? Well, I, I gained confidence uh, in my abilities to write for television. When I wrote that first episode, I didn't know what I didn't know. 
uh, and I sort of, you know, whistled all the way through it, and then and then it got rewritten uh, to a great degree and and made and made very well, and I learned a lot from seeing what Chris and the uh, and the writers. I'm not sure to this day who actually rewrote it. It might have been gang banged out, rewrote it. Uh, uh, might have been, you know. Sorry, that's a kind of a crude term, but that's, that's what we did quite often on the show, and sometimes in the writer's room. And, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, uh, that's, you know, one writer would take act one, one writer would take act two, stuff like that. That's, that's what I mean. And, um, but as I guess I gained confidence and in, in confidence in my ability to write for, for television, uh, as I, you know, during my seven years on the show, I learned, I learned how to write for television once I joined uh, the staff midway through the following season, season three. I, I learned an awful lot. Uh, I learned how to hit deadlines. I was very bad. I was a very bad self-starter before that. I was very bad about, uh, you know, being uh, good about, you know, achieving deadlines, uh, abiding by deadlines, and, and I learned that. And I, I was allowed to be funny. Uh, and I was not the first X-Files writer to write humor. Uh, Morgan and Wong, uh, who were two excellent writers uh, right from the season one of the show would write in the early, the very early days would write the funny stuff the mm -hmm. funny little bits and then uh, Glenn Morgan's brother Darren Morgan uh, wrote the first full-on humorous X-File episode and paved the way for for the rest of us to be able to do that so so I was not a pathfinder on that show but I, I learned an awful lot on that show uh, learned how to do the job that I wound up doing on, on Breaking Bad mm -hmm. And you got to direct on that show. As I well. got to. I was very lucky. Uh, about uh, five or six years in uh, my time on the show, I got to direct, uh, and I was very nervous about doing that. But I was very lucky to have been given that opportunity by Chris, and uh, that was a that was a great moment. That was, I mean, for me, it was <laughs> not for the show, but it was a great moment for me. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was just great to be able to do that. I was just nervous as hell, but I. Uh, it was a wonderful experience, and it. And that was also to, kind of somewhat unique at the time. Writers <laughs> directing their own episodes in television and episodic television. It it's perhaps perhaps not the typical experience, but I, I I'm I'm sure it had happened before. I, I'm not that much of a student of uh, the history of other shows uh, to to have knowledge of. I, I'm sure it had happened plenty of times before, but it was not necessarily the 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 uh, obvious thing to have happen. I, I don't certainly was not the first writer on a staff to get to do it, but uh, but it, it 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 was it was rare enough that it was. I felt very blessed to to be given that opportunity, and I I, I lobbied for it. I, I advocated for it, lobbied for it. I guess for several years leading up to Chris finally relenting and letting me do it. Had you ever done any directing? I directed uh, little films in my mom's basement when I was 11, 12 years old, little Super 8 films, and I had directed uh, student films and a thesis film at NYU, 16 millimeter. Okay. So but, you... but, I, but no, it was... But that, you knew that, about that coverage. Barely, and... Yeah, I mean, you know what? Uh, yeah, I learned that along the way in college and, and, and on my own, but I, I really, truly learned it uh, by being in the editing room on the X-Files for the five years previous to them allowing me to direct it. You learn it on the set, but you really learn it in the editing room. If you uh, want to direct, uh, it's obviously, uh, goes without saying, it's a good thing to, uh, and you haven't done it, it's a good thing to, to study acting, take an uh, acting for director's course, those kind of things, which I admit I have not done myself, but I, 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 give, it as, uh, I give it as good advice nonetheless. But, Must be why your actors suck so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, the thing that really, I think, holds a, the best thing you could do, even if you can't do that, that I just, that thought I just offered, the best thing you can do is spend time in an editing room. Or nowadays, with this amazing technology, we have Final Cut Pro and all that you can do on your own, on your laptop. You can, you can learn a lot of those skills on your own. But, but the time I spent in the X-Files editing room, really, I think more than anything else, and some of the time I spent, time I spent on the set, which was really not that often, but uh, that made me feel a little more comfortable being around the actors and whatnot. And of course, when you direct for the first time a television series that's been up and running for, at that point, six, seven years, you, uh, 
you can fall down on the job and the show will still get made without you. Uh, and and uh, I told myself that in, in the sense that I was very nervous going into it that I would fail, that I would cost this company a lot of money, that I would, I would embarrass myself, that I would cause problems, that I would make a big mess of things. And then I came to realize the DP could pretty much do it without me. The actors could pretty much do it without me. <laughs> that was not what happened. I was proud of the fact that I actually had a plan, and, and they were, and, but they were, they were there to help me. I mean, they were, as in, they had such a wonderful uh, attitude about it. They were there were to help every director who came down the pike, and, and, and it was just kind of such a great learning experience. But uh, they, they all knew their jobs very well. But, but the time I spent in the editing room, more than any other single thing, I think, held me in good stead when it was time to make a shot list and, and to direct an episode. Right. Yeah. Right, because you see how it's put together. Mm -hmm. You, you, talked you about see how it's put together and you see what you need versus what you don't because you, your time is so limited right. and constrained that you don't want to spend a lot of time getting a bunch of crap you don't need. Right. You need to concentrate on what you do need, especially in television. So. And obviously the script is pretty tight, so you're not shooting stuff that's going to wind up on the cutting room floor. You do sometimes, but but you endeavor not to, especially in television. Some things do wind up on the editing room floor, but, but not that much, typically. And you did, the first episode you directed was an episode that you also wrote? Yeah. Okay. So how was that? Because it was your own material. And did directing, how did your writing change after you started directing? That's a good question. How did it change? It, uh, well, the, the directing helped with this uh, uh, realization that I'm about to mention, but you don't have to direct your own stuff to make this realization. You can also make this realization by producing a TV show and, and, and seeing other people direct your words and seeing how they become realized on film or video or whatever. The thing you learn the more you do it is, is how little you need to, to explain sometimes to the audience. In other words, a lot of my old scripts I look at from, from 20 years ago I realize how didactic they are. I realize how it's just me. It's just characters saying, "Well, of course, Jim. Jim, how long have we been best friends?" You know, <laughs> that, that's the, the worst line in the history of the world. You know, Jim, how long have how long have we been brothers, Jim? Well, I'd say <laughs> 37 years this fall. You know, uh, I don't think I ever wrote that line exactly, but, but but you know what I'm talking about. That kind of that editorializing kind of crapola that we all do sometimes, and I've done more than my share of it, but one thing that, that seeing your words become reality week in and week out, this, this blessing we have as, as, as writing for television, being on a TV show, whether you're the boss or whether you're a uh, staff writer, seeing your words become reality week in and week out for years on end teaches you a great many things. One of, as I say, one of the most important things it teaches you is you don't have to explain everything through dialogue especially when you were lucky to have good actors, which I've always been lucky in, in TV to have good actors. They can put things across with a glance to one another that you think at the beginning of your career you need to spend a paragraph describing. And that was one of the greatest things I've learned over the years. And it helped seeing it as a director, but, but the truth is you can, you can learn that not ever directing, but, but just seeing your work uh, enacted by these actors and, and directed by other directors and you know being there in the editing room you realize it was one of the most f fun things on the X-Files uh, X-Files 2 but one of the most fun things on Breaking Bad was 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 cutting my own dialogue in the editing room it, it was very weirdly liberating you think oh these wonderful pearls that I've you know <laughs> put into the actors mouths I, I don't want to cut any of them the best thing is when you just when it's all the best thing to do is just jettison that kind of thinking. And the, the most fun times I had in the editing room were, let's cut this line, let's cut that line, let's cut this line, because we don't need it. This freedom you feel, and we don't need any of this crap. This is uh, the actors, you know, Brian Cranston or Aaron Paul put it across with a glance, you know. This is one fewer line, this is one less line of dialogue that, that uh, we have to translate into German or, or Norwegian or something. <laughs> you know, and I'm not even kidding. It's something about, you know, this is why film, well, it's, it's a visual medium, film or television. The, the idea of getting across a story through images rather than dialogue through word. Dialogue is great. It's important. It's uh, crucial. But the more you can put across through images, the more film becomes universal. The less, the more 
people around the world can enjoy it. You know, there are fewer forces, subtitles yeah. they have to read. You it know? forces your audience to pay attention as well. When you tell a story in a very e economical way, the audience has got to stay with you. Because if they miss a second, they miss something important. It makes it harder to look away, you know, while you're, you know, putting the mayonnaise on your sandwich or something. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you, I guess that's a, that's a good, yeah, that's a good point too, absolutely, sure. So, uh, we're, and we're going we're gonna to move on, because you did a show after The X-Files that I think people want to hear about. So we're, we're going to get to that. The Lone Gunman. <laughs> I was very proud of that. Shit, where did I... <laughs> that's not it. That was a heartbreaker because we only I know that's not what you're talking about, but <laughs> that was a that was a heartbreaker. Did I that, telegraph that with a glance? Yeah. Did I, did I that was a heartbreaker when that did not get picked up after the first thirteen. That was very sad. That was a very sad day for maybe not for anyone else, but for us who were working on it. Well we can talk about that. This is your time. So no, that's can, okay. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the loan guy. That's okay. I have, I have no, to be honest. No but, one is unfortunately. But, but before <laughs> Before we leave X Files, because obviously it was an important uh, part in your career, and nobody starts with running their own show, you had to go through these other yeah. steps to get to the point sure. where you were able to do Breaking Bad at the level that you did it at. Yeah. Um, I could not have done Breaking Bad if not for the seven years on the X Files. No, no, just no way, no way. So it was a great job. And and how did uh, how did that writers room work? You talked about gang banging. And, uh, and we can talk as much about that as you want. Sure. But, but the, the collaborative nature of it, were you writing it there in the room? How did that room work? And were there things that you took from that and things that you did not take from that? Yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Things that I took, things I did not take. They were, they were very different shows. X-Files, as, as we discussed, was a bit of a hybrid. But for the most part, at least my experience of it, it was an episodic show. I really had next to nothing to do with the mythology episodes. I was more of the creature of the week guy. And because it was an episodic show, the writer's room was not anything like the writer's room of Breaking Bad, which was very much all hands on deck, all the time together in the room as much as possible. On the X-Files, we would all wander away and, and go to our separate corners and and work on our own and take a lot of walks alone around the fox lot and and, and spend a lot of time you know uh, doing research a lot of solitary time spent uh, and so there was a writer's room but it would convene and then and then adjourn and then reconvene and then adjourn and there was it was it was much more catch as catch can uh, and it worked very well for that show and also there was uh, but it was not, I knew sort of instinctively that's not what you need to have for a uh, uh, very uh, serialized or hyper serialized show like Breaking Bad. You need all hands on deck for a show like Breaking Bad so that everyone is constantly up to date as to where the characters' heads are at. Right, right. All right, well, let's jump into Breaking Bad because obviously it's a, a much analyzed and much discussed show, and yet I, I, I still feel like from the point of view of how Breaking Bad got to be Breaking Bad, it's obviously, it, it comes from, from your vision and from the writing, and it begins with a pitch. I mean, you sold the pilot as, as a pitch, correct? Not as a spec. I, I sold it to, um, yes, yes, ultimately uh, sold it to, to both, uh, yeah, so st you start with the studio, sold it to the studio, uh, Sony, Sony Television, uh, sold it to Zach Van Amberg and Jamie Ehrlich, the two gentlemen who run, who run uh, Sony TV, uh, sold it to them as a, as a verbal pitch in the room. I, had, I pretty much had the first episode mapped out so that the pitch probably, uh, verbally probably, it went longer than they always tell you to make it go. Uh, they say 10, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. This probably went 25 to 30 minutes. But I pretty much pitched them the first episode verbally. Uh, and I, I'm not... I get very nervous pitching, so uh, what I did, and that what I typically do is I, I, I wrote this thing out into a, like a 12 or 15 page document and kind of uh, memorized it, had it in my in my jacket pocket in case I went 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 up on it, went went dry on it, but uh, had it pretty well uh, uh, memorized and just then just kind of reeled it off from memory, which took a lot of study time because I'm not a I'm not a quick study as far as memorizing stuff, but it was important to do it right. So, so you really went through a detailed pitch of the pilot. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously you must have talked about where it was going from there. Did you have the full five-year plan no, in your head? Or? No, not at all. I, 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 I pitched in great detail, as I say, that first episode, and, and I hoped that that would hook these, these potential buyers. Right. And luckily it, it did. 
and then when they said, where does it go from there, I, I would say, I would get very general at that point, but I would say something that, that we did abide by for the whole six years. I would say, this is a show about process. It's a show about transformation. It's a show about a guy willfully transforming himself from who he used to be to what he will become, and what he will become if you give me the time to do it. Uh, and I can't tell you right now how many years I think it should be, but I, what I want to do with this show is I want to take this Mr. Chips character and have him turn himself into, into Scarface. And it was, it, was, it was that general, and that was the pithy one-line sentence that I've probably said, like, balloons should drop from the ceiling. It's probably the millionth time I've said it. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's that old cliche about it's good to have this one-sentence pitch that, that people remember. And I, I, I have to say, this, this, one, this one helped me out a great deal. This was a, a good one-sentence pitch for this show. And we, yeah. and we stuck by that uh, self-imposed franchise. We, that's, that's, what, that's what the show was. So. Did anybody know who Mr. Chips was? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, it's funny. Uh, everyone says to me, what does Breaking Bad mean? But no one has said, wait a minute, Mr. Chips, what is that? I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm a movie buff, yeah, and I yeah. know the movie, but I mean, I, I told a producer one time on a film that I'm directing that my DP started as the camera loader on Dr. Zhivago when he was 20 years old, wow. which is true, Tony, uh, Tony Richmond. Mark Johnson. And, and, and the producer said, oh. what's Dr. Zhivago? That's embarrassing. That's terrible. <laughs> Mark Johnson, who uh, I talked about earlier, was, uh, was an extra in Dr. Zhivago. He was one of the guys who uh, reaches out to stop Julie Christie after she shoots Rod Steiger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then, then my DP knows him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't. No, 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 no. But, but yes, but, you, know, but point uh, you know what? Uh, oddly enough, uh, it's probably one of those things where some of the people in some of the rooms where I pitched that pitch probably just went, ha, ha, and then just, and then, and then, <laughs> and then mask, and then maybe, you know, on their iPhone, you know, when no one is looking, you know. Wow. So now how close, all right, so you sell the pitch. Uh, it was at FX, and then it wound up at, at AMC. Yeah. Where, but when you were writing it, it was still at FX. Yeah, I wrote it for, uh, I pitched it uh, once, once the studio attached themselves. Once the studio, once Zach Van Amberg and Jamie Ehrlich showed interest and said, we want to be your partners in this, we want to be the studio. Then they helped me find a distributor, in other words, a network, and, um, and we went around verbally pitching it yet again, just like I had done to them, to a couple, there were not that many potential suitors for this show because it's obviously very edgy and, and, and dark and R-rated. So especially in 2005, 2006, there were, not, there were fewer than there are now. Half as many, a third as many as there are now. There's a lot more now. Uh, but uh, at that time, it was really only uh, FX and Showtime and HBO. That was probably it, honestly. Those three, unless I'm forgetting something. That was, that was about it, really. Uh, and, and we knew if, if those three didn't bite, uh, we would, you know, we knew we wouldn't go on forever with this pitching process. It would either be uh, we quickly realized we didn't have anything or we'd be off to work, one or the other. And luckily, uh, I mean, I mean hap happily, uh, FX uh, was interested. Uh, and then they, they wound up going, uh, and I, I, was, I, was, I was, you know, I always want to tell this whole story to show there's a lot of good folks in the business who, FX didn't ultimately make Breaking Bad, as we all know, but uh, John Landgraf, who runs FX, was a really stand-up guy who wanted to make it, but the realities, the financial realities of the business being what they are, they could only do one uh, pilot that particular year, and he had been told by his boss, get more women watching FX. So it came down that particular year to, to uh, Breaking Bad or Dirt, the TV show Dirt. And by the way, you know, I would have voted for Dirt myself if I was in <laughs> back then because Dirt had a, had a TV star attached, uh, Courtney Cox. We had nobody attached. And we were a show about a 50-year-old guy dying of cancer and cooking meth. <laughs> and, and, and so, so everyone, everyone kind of, you know, it's everyone, I told this story before and people kind of snicker, oh, those fucking idiots at FX. They, they weren't idiots, they, and no one has a crystal ball, and I would have made the same call, you know. And it's just, uh, this is the business. This is the business we're in where it's like, you know, uh, I had a chance to buy Berkshire Hathaway stock 20 years ago at 2,000 bucks a share, and now it's I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Now it's over 100,000. 
I'm a fucking idiot because I don't have a crystal ball. You know, it's like no one has a crystal ball. So. But you've done okay. I mean, my point is, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm just, I'm, I'm guess I'm making the point that, uh, that uh, not all executives are. He was a, not all executives are idiots, and uh, these guys were stand-up guys because they let when AMC came knocking, they let right. the script go, uh, and uh, and that was a very stand-up thing that that most shops in town won't won't do. They won't do you that courtesy because people don't like to be potentially embarrassed on the million to one chance that the thing they passed on becomes <laughs> a, a hit. They don't want to be embarrassed. Right, right, right. And and. These guys were stand-up guys at FX, and I'll always I'd, I'd do business with them tomorrow. I mean, yeah. they're great guys. So, the script that you wrote, how close was it to what you pitched, and how many rewrites did that first pilot script go through? Um, uh, gosh, and I, I apologize for my lack of uh, I, details. Grow fuzzy <laughs> for me, but I probably did uh, two or three drafts while it was at probably three at the most while it was at FX. Uh, and then maybe I did two more uh, before we shot it as a pilot. Uh, and when I said drafts, they were certainly not ground up re reimaginings or anything. It was just it was it was changing a little bit of detail here and there. Uh, there was a scene in, in an early draft of the pilot uh, that we took out uh, for for time and, and and budget reasons of the pilot. Took it out of the pilot, put it in episode two or three, which was Walt blowing up a guy's car. By, by shorting out the battery. Oh, terminals. with the squeegee thing, yeah. he puts it on the battery of his and car. The, in the original version, he had gotten for his 50th birthday a, a uh, uh, year membership to a, to a, a health club, and some, some guy is being a real creep in the, in the you know, like working out at the, you know, in the, in the, the weight area, the free weight area, and he's just kind of a douchebag, and, and he drives some fancy car, and Walt sees this and, and shorts out the battery terminals in the pilot episode. That all went away. That was something we cannibalized and, as I say, used a couple episodes later in a different setting. Right. But uh, it did not, structurally it remained uh, very much uh, the script that I first wrote. Uh, it's just we, you know, as I say, we moved a few things around. We, we lost a few things for, for time and money. Right. Okay. But fundamentally it remained? Very, very much, yeah. As I was going through it, and I watched and rewatched a lot of the episodes, and they're just amazing. I mean, every time you watch them, you get more and more out of them. So I, I, I can't be effusive enough when I, when I talk about the show and the writing and the acting, all of it, and the directing. Uh, I mean, they, each episode feels like a film. Oh, I mean, it's just a, a, amazing. But one of the things that really struck me that I wanted to get out of tonight, and, and, and I'm sure the people here do too, Walter White is such a layered character. There's so many sides to him. And you talked about the transformation from basically Walter White to Heisenberg. And of course, a lot of those elements had to be within him all along. I mean, the rage and the anger and the ego and, yeah. and those things. But, you know, we all have that. I yeah. mean, I just described every writer when I talked about <laughs> that. Um, yeah. And we don't all become killers and meth heads and everything like that. So, how does this complex character become this complex character? Is it something that happens? You know, over time, how much of it was there in the beginning? I mean, I watched the pilot again the other night, and he says to Jesse, you know, I'm awake. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, okay, that really set the groundwork for everything that came, and it ties in with the episode at the very end where he says, I felt alive. Th and thank you. And, but but the, the question is, and I'm, I'm not being facetious here, the question is, I'm not even sure I know the answer myself. The question is, did I have it all figured out? No, I know the answer to this. I didn't. But I mean, <laughs> the question is, how do I word this question? Did, did, did the subsequent work we did, uh, it, it, built, it built on that, that scaffolding, that structure, that, that, that skeleton that was in that first episode, but how much of it, what was, what was uh, original conception that was built upon later in subsequent episodes, and how much or versus how much was you know getting the group mind together of the six excellent writers I had, and thinking about what was established in that first episode and and adding to it. I'm not wording this well, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the answer to what you just asked is is 
This is the beautiful thing about collaboration. This is the thing I love about television writing that I didn't think I would love back when I was a feature writer. I came to writing uh, 20 years ago or longer ago when I was in high school, whatever. I, I, it seemed like a very solitary act. It seemed like something you did by yourself. And, and it is, as we all know, it's quite often that. It is indeed that. But TV writing, which I didn't think I would have a particular facility for necessarily before I ever did it, became a real, it just, I didn't realize just how much I would enjoy the collaborative nature of it. So much of what made Breaking Bad great, if it was, you know, the, the things about Breaking Bad that were great, so much of those things derived from the six of us, uh, seven of us counting me in the writer's room and coming up with ideas that to this day I couldn't tell you who came up with what idea. You know, this, this hive mind, this group mind that, that, that gets going when all everybody's juices are flowing and everybody's pulling on the rope in the same direction. So there's the collaborative, the collaborative creature that is all the, the minds of the writers working in glorious unison. And then there's, the, uh, there's what the, uh, the actors give you and what the directors give you and what the crew gives you. Everyone else, everyone adding to this uh, stone soup, as we discussed earlier. I mean, it's in the best possible way. So a lot of the best things about Breaking Bad were things that, in, in short, a lot of the best things about Breaking Bad were things that I was not thinking of when I was alone writing that first episode. They were things that came to be when, when all these other really good folks were on the payroll and we were all working together. Okay, I want to get to the first clip now, which um, this is all just so fascinating. I thought we would get to the first clip a little bit sooner than this, but uh, this, again, it, it is from the first season, and it speaks to the idea of establishing his character. So can we uh, pull up the first clip? And I, I'll apologize ahead of time. Because we are taping, when we do the clips, we're going to have to kill the lights. Wow. Um, so that, aside from being just a wonderful scene, um, that's a, a fairly long speech uh, yeah. in, in a show that generally is very terse oh. and, and yeah. moving. So, right. and, and I know you said when we first spoke about you coming yeah. in and doing the evening, um, you remember he said, well, I don't do that much rewriting. <laughs> he said, we do a lot of the rewriting and the outlining of it. We do, we, 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 we think it through. It's not that we do the rewriting and the outlining so much as uh, we, we, we do the heavy lifting and the, and the, and the breaking of the story during the, during the, during the, the breaking of the story, during the, during the part where all, I guess I should speak in past tense, but when all seven of us are sitting around the table for 10 hours a day, you know, weeks on end, typically these episodes too, uh, as, as well, also, uh, took about, on average, I don't know, two, three weeks uh, per episode to, to break during that, that process where it's all hands on deck and we talk through it in, in just excruciating detail, minute detail, and we don't say, we never said, like on the show, we never said, okay, there should be a scene now where uh, something freaky happens. I, figure it out when you write it. You know, I, we never, we, it was, ex the, the, the heavy lifting of Breaking Bad all took place in the, in, the, in the writer's room with all seven of us together. You know, talking through a scene like that, we'd be like, okay, where does the scene take place? Well, the White House, okay, who's sitting where? I mean, we were like psychotic about the level of detail that we would discuss ad nauseum. You know, who's, who's wearing what? And then the writer of that episode after two or three weeks of this kind of a process, although to be fair, probably in that first season we didn't, have that long to break uh, an individual episode. That might have been broken in a week and a half or so, but uh, the longer the show went, you know, somehow the, the work expands to, 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 to fit, to, to fill the time, and we, we got to the point in season, in our final season, our final eight, we probably, each episode broke in about three and a half, four weeks. So, so we, we were very lucky to have the time we had, uh, and most shows do not, do not get that, that uh, leisurely uh, amount of, of time, but, but that's where the heavy lifting, lifting took place. So that the end of that breaking process, any one of the writers, me included, could have gone on and written the episode. If, if one of us had dropped in our traces, as they say, someone else could have, could have taken over. Uh, and then, you know, there was still plenty of invention of creation to, to happen in the, 
in the uh, in the writing process. Well, that that was going to be what I because uh, different writers have different opinions on right. on the outlining process. I remember uh, when James L. Brooks came in and he said, "I don't consider that I've started writing until I write dialogue." Yeah, and I don't agree. With, I mean, he's a he's a brilliant guy, but I, yeah, I don't see it that way. But, it doesn't work yeah, that way for me. Exactly, yeah. and so you can have very, very amazing, accomplished writers who have very, very different approaches to the yeah. work. Sure, and that's why and I that's think great. it's so fascinating that you do it the way you do. But when I watch a scene like that, and what I'm wondering is because that speech is so pivotal, you could have the whole scene broken and say, and here's the scene where he sits down and tells Skylar that he's not going to do the chemo. But how detailed do you get with the content of the speech, or does that It was pretty detailed. It was. It was, in the room. And, and the writer of that episode, a woman named Patty Lynn, did an excellent job bringing it to fruition. Uh, but we did not, in the writer's room, say, okay, the family gets together. Uh, there's a turn where you know, Skyler wants him to get chemo, and then he says no. Figure out how that happens. We don't leave. Didn't we? Would never leave. I would. I would never leave that to the writer. I would never want anyone to leave that. You know, to I, I would. I. That's not the way we did it. We 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 probably talked through that scene. I'm forgetting the details now. Help me out if I'm saying something wrong. But I, we probably talked through that. Just that scene, probably for two or three days, and and uh, and you know. Very often dialogue was generated in the room, okay. not all of it, okay. but a few highlight lines of dialogue here and there were most likely on every episode generated in the room. And then, uh, of course, having said that, one of the, to, to go the opposite, to, to, to give an example of, 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 of the exception that, that, that breaks the rule here, one of the nicest moments in that scene, and, and it happened before the clip began that you showed, was... Um, I can't remember if it's been a while since I've seen it, but Skyler or, or, or uh, Marie has, uh, has the idea of the talking pillow. Anyone who has the talking right, pillow right, has right, a floor. Right, yeah. That we did not create in the room. That was a uh, creation of, of Patty Lynn. She created that on the page. Okay. And, and, you know, I could certainly make the argument, uh, someone, folks here are probably thinking as I'm saying this, well, gee, it sounds like if you, if you, talk it through in that kind of detail that can stifle creativity and and that is a valid argument it uh, uh, it can be a valid argument but this is the way we did it for 62 episodes and 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 when moments like the talking pillow came out of the the spur of the moment uh, inspiration that the writer had we, we went with them because you know I'm not going to throw away something great like that just because we didn't break it as a group mind in the room but by and large we, we talked through these episodes in, in excruciating detail. And therefore, uh, we didn't really do that much rewriting. We never, there was a little bit of rewriting. We'd probably shoot typically the blue draft or the pink draft, you know, of a, of a script, more often probably the blue. But it's because we had just worked for just hours and hours, thousands and thousands of man hours uh, in aggregate on these things. And so, the thinking and the rethinking and the you know all the, the plotting and the planning and the all that stuff had had been done by everybody together. It's such an important character aspect of him where he said, "All my life, I've never been the one to get to choose." Where did that discovery come? Did you know that when you were writing the pilot that that kind of sums up who this man is, or was that something that when we talked about building the layers of the character, where did that discovery come from? That probably came again with the with the once once these writers were hired. Uh, there were certain uh, uh, aspects to Walter White that, that are latent within him that are that are self-evident, I suppose. You know, from that first episode, I am awake. A guy who says, who makes a point of saying, I am awake in your first episode is someone who has been not clearly sleepwalking through the previous 50 years. But you you take those 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 uh, touchstones, those those uh, those you know uh, waypoints, and you. As a, as a group of people, you 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 know you 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 look at what you have to work with, and you and you continue to build upon that foundation, and and that's what we did. And a lot of this stuff I would have never come up with if you'd give me a hundred years all on my own. The great thing about the the multiplicative, multiplying whatever effort of of, of six writers instead of one is not just that you get things done six times faster or, or whatever multiple faster, but that. Things 
come to you, things come to the room that you would, I would, I would have never come up with on my own. I mean, I, that, that goes without saying, that's an obvious statement. But that's one of the many things I love about the, the writer's room. So rewriting obviously comes about sometimes for creative reasons or discoveries are made, and then there's rewrites that happen for logistical reasons. We did that sometimes, every so now and then. That's, yeah. leads, it leads us into our next clip, yeah. uh, which, which we, we had talked about. Um, if we could bring up, it's um, Moss number one. That's another good example. That was um, the original idea we had was that he climbs on the roof and uh, what was it? Who was in the thing? But it, the, the guy it's takes a off. playing poker. No, no, no. But I mean, the original version was not a couple playing poker. Oh. It was uh, some crazy guy takes him on a wild Mr. Toad's wild ride, and oh, yeah. and Hank is hanging on the top oh, and sliding yeah. around, and there's a chase, and and Gomez in the uh, in the uh, black jeep is is chasing after him, and and uh, just it could not. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the time. So we thought, well, how do we end? How do we button this scene? We already we've already rented the. Uh, the location, that, that was an area uh, down by the, uh, the river, uh, the Rio Grande. Rio Grande, Rio Grande. I guess Rio Grande is right. Anyway, uh, that we turned into an RV park. And uh, we've, the scene, we need to button the scene. We need to make the point we need to make, which is uh, how do we do it on the, on the cheap, yeah. relatively. And, and so we came up with that at the 11th hour, the, the couple in the, uh, in the RV. And they don't even need wardrobes, so it's much more safer. I know. We save money on wardrobe. They were both uh, sports, those, those two folks. They were very, uh, they, were, they were good folks. Uh, I wouldn't do that myself. So that was, <laughs> <laughs> they, they were, uh, I appreciated them uh, getting down to their skivvies there. Yeah. At, at what point did you make that, that change? Pretty much at the 11th hour because uh, we, we thought we were, no one told us we'd be able to do this. You just, you, you. You're optimistic. You 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 think it's going to work out, and then you realize as the numbers get crunched uh, by the producers in, in Albuquerque, you you realize certain things just are going to have to be changed, have to go by the wayside because there's just not enough money, right. not enough time to, to to produce them. So, right, and because you you came to it now with a directing background, having worked on X Files, and because you did direct, I mean, you directed the pilot and you directed many episodes. Um, are you boarding it in your head as you're writing it? Yeah, uh, you, you get to the point, uh, so, somewhat, yeah. Uh, and, and then you, you, you have your different hats. You have your writer's hat and then your producer's hat, and you, you find yourself swapping one, you know, figuratively sp speaking, swapping one for the other. And there were times where we approached it uh, not enough like producers, uh, but there were other times, conversely, where we, we censored ourselves a bit. Um, by thinking too much like producers, okay, you know this scene. Uh, if we if we have three things happen at this one bar location, then we can you know blah blah blah. So it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky uh, road to hoe, as they say, because it's like you want you want to be a good producer, but you don't want to censor yourself. You want to censor yourself just enough, but not unnecessarily. I am not a particularly great producer in terms of. Uh, knowing how best to spend money or what's doable, what's not doable. I know more about it now than I used to 15 years ago, 20 years ago, but, but there are still times where I will think I know that something is impossible and then I'll talk to my producers. I would talk to my producers and they said, no, we, actually that's something we can do. Yeah. Versus sometimes you think it's something that's relatively easy and then you call up the producer or they call and they say, we can't do that. And you say, what are you kidding? And you get mad. But uh, it's a, it's a learning process. The more I do it, the more I know. But there's still so much I don't know about the physical vagaries of production. It's, a, it's still a learning process for me. And, and you're doing that as you're breaking the story. Before you've even written the script, you're thinking about these things. Oh, yeah. You have to on a TV schedule. Uh, and and as, I, as you guys gleaned from what I was saying before, we, uh, we have typically, we had typically way more time uh, to think these things through uh, than, than most shows get. And, and time, time is, is just the best thing of all, to have time to think this stuff through. And I think having the time to think these episodes through in, in minute detail made for a better show, made for fewer uh, loose ends uh, throughout the 62 episodes, and also saved us money in the long run because the more advanced planning time you have, the more uh, you, with the help of your producers, can, can figure out Gee, is there a cheaper way to, to tell this story 
just as effectively. Uh, so I would recommend it for, for any, certainly any uh, network TV shows, you, there's so many episodes you're responsible for that there's just, there's no way you can have that amount of lead time. But, but a cable show doing 13 episodes or fewer a season, uh, it's, it's more possible. And, and I would recommend it for, for, for anyone. A lot of times, you know, you, you wind up looking through the wrong end of the telescope. You get a little penny wise and pound foolish in, in television, like like a lot of like, like a lot of uh, industries. But uh, it seems to me having paying a little more for uh, a few more weeks of writer's room before production starts can ultimately save money and and make for a better show. Certainly, because you're not just breaking a story. You're not just breaking an episode. I mean, you're breaking a season. I yeah. mean, when you open the beginning of the season with the shot in the pool of the eyeball floating in yeah. there, that doesn't happen until the end of the season with the right. plane crash. Right, exactly. So you broke, I mean, you know where you're ending when you start the beginning of the season. We knew, uh, that was a tough season. We, we knew that we were opening with the image that would end that particular season 13 episodes later. We knew before we uh, started truly breaking episodes that year that, that the cause of that pink teddy bear being in the pool was a plane crash. We knew, uh, as writers, we knew that the plane crash had to have been caused at least inadvertently by Walter White's actions or inactions because if it were simply a coincidence, nobody would, would, would buy or nobody would be satisfied by that. But that's about all we knew. We didn't know how as we got into the season. You didn't know Jane and you didn't, we didn't know, know that Jane. Whole thing. We didn't know Jane. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, we 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 uh, no we we uh, you knew a plane crash and an eyeball yeah and 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 Walt was get, responsible you have to get there from here yeah and we uh, that was a very hard season to break and we uh, I think we had to shut down that season the one time we had a forced shutdown because we ran out of scripts because we were far behind and that was very unpleasant and I don't ever want to do that again that was, wow. I was I felt like it was a moral failing on my part that was unpleasant but uh, luckily it never happened after that point but also we never did that kind of a bookended circular uh, shape to a season after that. I mean, I was, you kind of did with the New Hampshire, it. the yeah, 52nd birthday. That, no, you're right. We did a little bit there. That's true. And we, and we, and you're right. We did. And we had an M60 machine gun that Walt purchases, and we didn't quite know what it would be used for. Jesus, so. that takes balls. I mean, that, that must be so terrifying. That it, it, it often was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> My God. Well, let's, let's get into the Moss Clip 2. All right, so uh, again, just amazing, amazing acting, amazing oh, writing. Amazing um, acting, absolutely. Gus is a character who came in, you know, somewhat into the run, became a more important character. Yeah. Uh, again, was, was he there? Was he part of the conception of it from the beginning, or this was? No, and this is a good, this was not, this was not, this, this is quasi rewriting. Uh, this is rewriting uh, or replotting ahead of the script actually being written. But this is a good example. This is an excellent segue because, uh, using Gus as an example, because in season two, we had uh, our bad guy in our mind, uh, the writers and I had it for our season uh, lasting bad guy, this guy Tuco Salamanca, uh, played by Raymond Cruz, who is the crazy snorting meth off the end of the Bowie knife, crazy son of a bitch shooting cows with the M16. and. Got the uncle in the wheelchair out in the middle of nowhere, and just just crazy, just meth head bastard, you know, scary as hell, wild eyed. Talking about the character, the, 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 the actor is actually a very lovely guy. He's nothing like that, but he does a wonderful job portraying that. And that is the bad guy we thought we would have for the entirety of uh, season two, and uh, we learned much to our chagrin uh, in the early going of season two that. Uh, as much as Raymond wanted to be on our show on a continuing basis, he was contractually tied up doing the TV series The Closer. And we, and The Closer, the folks at The Closer were very nice. They, they worked very, very uh, vigorously to help us get one more episode out of, or out of Ray uh, that we had to shoot as episode five, but air as episode two. So it was just hellaciously uh, just migraine inducing because continuity wise we we had to write this th we had to write these things out of order the show obviously is hyper serialized and yet we had to write things a little out of order did we or we 
anyway, we broke them in order, but we had to shoot it, shoot shoot them way out of order, and uh, we 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 ended uh, Tuco's uh, uh, story on a on a very dramatic note where he very gets dramatic. in a shootout with Hank and, yeah. and loses, and it was we're very proud of the episode, but then we're like, oh man, now what do we do? We lost this really exciting, cinematic, crazy bad guy, and. Um, we said to ourselves, we need another bad guy. But we're not going to find anyone more crazy, scary than, than Tuco, and that would be kind of a fool's errand to try. And if we find uh, another guy who's crazy, scary, you know, it just it's, it's, we start to feel redundant or, or like we'd already done it. So what's the opposite of Tuco? Well, Gustavo yeah. Fring is the opposite of, of Tuco. He's, he is uh, professional and mild-mannered and polite and soft-spoken and, and business-like and, and sober and, and clean-cut and, well, Tuco was clean-cut. Anyway, he's, uh, he's, he's everything, in other words, that, uh, that Tuco was not. And yet we knew ultimately we, we, we in, were going to endeavor to make him even scarier yeah. than Tuco. And thank goodness we, we found the absolute perfect actor for that, for that job. Uh, Giancarlo Esposito. Boy, did you. I mean, he's just chilling. He's fantastic, just wonderful. Um, so that is, a, a, luckily for us, because we work so far in advance, uh, we did not have to rewrite a bunch of, or re-break a bunch of episodes when we got that news, thank God. But Because uh, the killing of Tuco is an important plot point that drives everything that comes after it, really. It, it is, exactly. Uh, and the cousins show up and all of the stuff that unfolds. From exactly. That. And the cousins, he says in that episode, my cousins are driving up from Mexico. We're going to put you in the, you know, in the trunk. We'll get you down to you know, Oaxaca or whatever. We'll cook. And, and that was a throwaway line, the cousins. And then we realized at the beginning of the next season, this, this was... A lot of people ask uh, throughout the show, and, and now that it's over, they would say, did you have it all planned out in advance? And the answer is, is no. But the thing that I'm proud of is that, that we endeavored to make it seem like we had it all planned out. <laughs> and, 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 and the way we did that, it was we were very good sh um, uh, shepherds. We were very good uh, uh, we, we, stewards. Thank you, stewards. We were very good stewards of our, of our own show's history. So, for instance, the beginning of season three, we would say, wasn't there some line about cousins coming up from Mexico to, to pick up uh, Tuco and, and the guys? What did you think ever happened to those guys? They must have they <laughs> crossed the border and come into uh, New Mexico and then found out their cousin was dead. What if uh, we, we play them out, play out that thread? So, so not thought of well in advance, but nonetheless, we, 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 we mined our history uh, it often happens, don't you find, even when you're doing a rewrite, that the answer is somewhere within what you've already written. You may have glossed over it, you know, a line or whatever, but you go back and somewhere the characters within the script are telling you where to go. Yes, it. and that's the best, the, the, yeah. the best kind of organic moments where, where the characters indeed are telling you. The best moments I had on the X-Files were I would hear, I literally would, I'm not even joking, I would hear Mulder and Scully arguing in my head and I would, I would transcribe it. I mean, that... That is, those are really good days of writing, and, and not all writing days are that good or that easy. They don't always flow that well, but when they do, it's a, it's a really good feeling. When it feels very organically derived or arrived at. Fortunately, some of them are that way because that's what keeps you going when you're yeah. having a hard one. Well, I always say, I've probably said this before too, but, but not here tonight. I, I, people say, do you like being a writer? And I always say, I like having written. Past tense. It's it's always satisfying, pretty much always satisfying in past tense. But but the job itself is like driving nails into your forehead most days. So. Now there, there's a moment here where I mean again Walter's trying to get out and Gus pulls him back in. There are many moments during the show where he's almost out or he is out yeah. and he gets back in. Was there ever a concern of how do we keep this from feeling like a repeat of a prior moment? Oh, how absolutely. And we probably had a couple moments along the way that, that seemed a bit uh, like, I and mean, we tried very hard not to do that. And, and by the way, that's a big reason why we ended the show when we did. I, I, I was phobic about us repeating ourselves, us, us hitting the, uh, the peak and then coasting and then heading downhill. You know, uh, I was phobic about us jumping the shark. And, 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 and the longer a show goes, at the beginning of every year that a series is on the air, 
you and your writers sit around and say, man, what have we, we've done a lot already. What, what, what is left to do? Right. And typically you, you find something to do, but, but with every successive year, the, the options available to you are, they, they, they grow, they lessen. They, there's less new things to do with your characters. And, and so that's in large part why I wanted to end it when I did and, and uh, you know. Um, and then you add those things on to make it even more challenging on top of it by putting in things like the floating pool, by putting in things like the machine gun in the trunk, where you have to now, you've put the gun on the table, you have to pay it off. It, it's, it, it, we, we, didn't, we didn't do it to make our lives harder. Uh, it did have that effect. <laughs> we, we did it to, uh, we love showmanship. It's a, that's, I think we all do in this room. All of us writers, we love showmanship. You want, you want to create those uh, non-submergible uh, moments, as Kubrick called them. You want those things that people are not going to forget. You want, you want to come up with that stuff that people, you hope for immortality through your, your work. And, and the best way it seems to achieve that is come up with these big moments of showmanship. So that's why we would do things like you, you want to, you know, you want to hook them and grab them and, and reel them in, and 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 that's you know we would do that with the, as much as we could with the teasers, right. which is I learned I took that I ripped that off straight from the X Files. The the X Files structure of a teaser and four subsequent acts, you know, teaser title sequence and then Act One, Act Two, Act Three, Act Four. That's ex of Breaking Bad is exactly the same structure of the X-Files. I mean, I took that whole cloth from the X-Files. And uh, furthermore, I took Chris Carter's philosophy of just grab them, just grab them uh, as, as quickly as you can in those first three to five minutes. And then at the, every, at the end of every subsequent act out, give them a reason to keep watching. I mean, that, it's not like he invented that. It's, that's, that's one of the basic rules of drama, but... Uh, but your we, teasers we, got more and more I don't want to say avant-garde, but less connected to the episode that followed in sometimes, terms of, it sometimes, wasn't just a prologue, yeah. it really was yeah. a flash forward or something from the past yeah. or whatever. So you definitely got more kind of abstract with your teasers. And we did that often uh, on the X-Files too. We, we uh, I was, I'd be kind of fun to have just uh, uh, like a Blu-ray of just the teasers from the X-Files. You know, there was 202 of them and there were some damn good ones. And uh, I, again, I mean, uh, you know, as I say, Chris Carter did not invent that. that. That's as old as, you know, the Greek playwrights and whatnot. But, but he really, you know, we, 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 uh, you know, we had the pedal to the metal as far as, you know, hooking people or try attempting to hook people on that show and then keep them watching with the cliffhanger act outs. And, and I, I, I love the way he did it on that show. And I, I, I took that to heart when I began doing Breaking Bad. I wanted to do it that way. Even though it wasn't a supernatural show or sci-fi or horror, I figured nonetheless, you know, same rules of drama obviously apply. Audience, yeah. you want to pull them in. Yeah. All right, there, there's one more clip I want to show. We are going to open it up for questions in a couple of minutes. I had to make sure that we got to that. Uh, I, was, I was there that day. I directed the scene, and, 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 and I didn't realize until I got to the editing room that, that there was that imprint of the muzzle of the pistol. I, I, I was there. I was... And I didn't even see it until I was in the editing room. It, it's so much, this is collaborative. I mean, these guys were so into the moment, both actors, that it's just this, in, this amazing impression left in uh, Brian Cranston's forehead that I didn't even notice. So much of what was great in this show uh, was, was, was this result of this, this group, this collaborative effort. You know, it's just amazing. And that scene was, God, that was hard to, those guys really got me through that because I, I just wasn't feeling it. It just, something wasn't working. And I wasn't sure what it was. That that scene took a whole day to shoot, and they were exhausted by the end of it. But they never complained because I kept saying, "I don't know if this is right. Maybe we should have you knock to the floor." And then, because we did a bunch of takes where he didn't go to the floor, and it was anyway. It was, uh, you know, it's a group effort. Anyone who says it's not, it, it, it's a group effort. Obviously, always. So, are there generally a lot of takes when you're when you're shooting? Um, it depends on the director. I, I, I would tend to do more than a lot of our really, uh, you know, TV directing, it's a very tricky thing because it's like you got you to gotta make it as, you know, you got you to gotta serve a lot of masters. You got to, if you're, if you're not the showrunner, you know, I got, I got a lot of, uh, uh, I got a lot of, uh, I was able to do things most of our directors would not have had the time or the wherewithal. I mean, wouldn't have the, someone would have yelled at them or threatened to fire them before. <laughs> You know, I, I tended to do more takes because I no one 
very, you know, I didn't, I got yelled at a little, but no one was going to fire me, so luckily. Uh, directors who do this uh, week in and week out on, 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 on many shows come in as journeymen, journey, journey women, you know, come in and, and, and do this great work uh, uh, under much tougher constraints or to be applauded because it's, uh, and, and with fewer takes at their disposal and all of that. It's, it's, it's impressive, uh, you know, folks who, who do that and do it well. It's a, it's a real skill. And when you wrote that scene, I mean, obviously you're hearing it, you're envisioning it, you know the actors, you you know them. But when you see it unfold, I mean, were there things about it that changed, or it was it was more than you had imagined? It, this scene worried me greatly. It was not. I was not really feeling it. Uh, I did not write. This was the first time I ever directed anything in my life that I hadn't written. This episode was written by uh, Tom Schnauz and Moira Wally Beckett, uh, who did a great job. And I barely touched this scene. Uh, I didn't touch, I, I mean, I barely had, I didn't touch anything. I'd, as the show progressed, I would give verbal notes or I'd write them on the script and then the writer would go off and do a rewrite. But this, I didn't even think I did anything on this particular speech of this, this scene of these two characters. I, I literally didn't change a word, I don't think. Uh, certainly not on the page. As we shot the scene, I might have added a word or two, you know, uh, you know, Brian, as you're going to the floor here, maybe you should say this, just to you know, maybe add another word or two here to to, to bridge this gap, that kind of stuff, you know. But uh, the scene, I didn't feel, I, I felt it was kind of laying there because it not there was one spot that it, it was causing me grief because I didn't want Aaron, I didn't want Jesse rather to sit there and wait artificially while while Walt had his realization and began to laugh. I, it felt that was really tricky. It, it felt artificial to me that he would wait, you know. I, and I kept saying, you know, just push this guy around, kick him, kick him in the. I mean, don't hurt him, but in, you know, do something here. You're not going to sit around and wait for him to laugh. And he, you know, pulled out all the chops acting wise. They both did, but there was some, just by the very construction of what we had given them, there was there was that somewhat artificial pause, and I was really worried about it. But then when it all came together, I, I. I ceased to worry because uh, the editor, Kelly Dixon, who edited that scene, I didn't give her any notes in the scene when it was edited either. She just put it together beautifully. The actors killed themselves to make it good. And, you know, sometimes you're just there eating a sandwich. Just, so, you know, <laughs> and you're not really, you know, doing that much as a director. You think you are, but you're not sometimes. As Cocker said, the director's the one guy that said he doesn't have a job once the camera's rolling. Well, there's a lot of truth that thing about you've done nine-tenths of your job if you've cast it well. Yeah. so. And Aaron Paul, I mean, everybody knows that Brian Cranston, you got him from an, an episode of X-Files, but Aaron Paul was also on an episode of the X-Files. Yes, he was, uh, written by my friend Tom Schnauz, who, who was the co-writer of that particular episode, that clip who just... And I didn't realize when he came in to read, Aaron came in to read, that he had been on an X-File because we were so scattered, you know, we weren't always in the writer's room together. We were doing our own thing, and I had certainly seen the episode, but I was not there on the set of that particular X-File. I didn't realize he had been on an X-File until I looked it up on his resume there, so. And uh, obviously, I've, I've, we've heard, all heard talk that you were gonna, the Jesse character was gonna get killed off originally. Yeah. And at what point did you realize, now we better not kill this guy off? Very early on. Yeah. I think I probably told him that story on the first episode after the pilot, maybe the second. I can't even remember, it was very early on because uh, after the first episode after the pilot probably because he was just too good yeah. and I told him the story not to freak him out I told him the story had to to say boy this is how good you are because I was going to kill you off and you've made yourself unkillable right. but I really freaked him out inadvertently because he had the thought hadn't occurred to him that he might be <laughs> killed off and then Brian Cranston was merciless from that point on or Brian would make it a point to read the script first before Aaron got to and he would say Oh, buddy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good run. It was a good run. Oh, my God. You go out good, you know. So he would, he would, uh, he would mess with him mercilessly, and, and Aaron would get these eyes would go wide, you know. Did it, uh, just one more thing, and we're going to open up in one second, so thank you for being so patient. I know everybody here, a lot of people have questions. Did it change at all, the process, the writing process, between season one and season five? 
you got so much more attention. You had fans and critics who were hanging on every word and every shot. And you had just learned stuff as the show had gone, al had gone along. Did the writing process and the rewriting process change at all from season one to season five? It, it slowed down, um, not on purpose, but because I, I got more anxiety ridden. I got more neurotic about about making people happy. I mean, I always that's you always want to do that. You always want to make the viewers happy from day one. But when you realize that you really start are starting to have actual viewers and and the viewership is rising and and people <laughs> people are enjoying the show, you want to you want to please them. You want to give them even more of the things that that they like, and you want to be more clever the next time around, and you want to. Be more surprising, and you want to be—you know—you want to swing for the fences even even more so than ever, and you want you want those big showmanship moments more than ever. And again, that's in large part why it came time to end the series before we were unable to advance those moments any further. You know, at a certain point, you you run out of the ability to 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 surprise and, and delight. You know people and and you got to know when to leave the stage so that was uh, we didn't I didn't want to I didn't want the show to be over but I, I wanted it more than anything I wanted it to end on a high note that was paramount so uh, you it, got your wish well thank you and it was it was hard to to quit but it was uh, it wasn't that hard to quit when I knew that the alternative was if we stick around too long we'll hear those awful words that those awful sentences of hey is that show still in the air I used to love that show oh you know? my god and wow. and and I've been through that I've been through that you know um, I didn't want to go through it on this so can you think of the key change that maybe you made early on that made a huge difference yeah story-wise you mean yeah the, the, the one of the moments I'm one of the moments I am proudest of was in uh, that episode, the first clip you showed with the talking pillow and, and that wonderful scene uh, that Patty Lynn wrote, um, that episode was our deus ex machina episode, purposefully. That episode was aired as the fourth episode to air, uh, and that was the episode where we figured out, the writers and I figured out, that this, this was not going to be a show in which uh, it was like the 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 Laurel and Hardy meth catastrophe of the week. You know, it's like it, we 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 realized in that episode that, in other words, that you know, Walt couldn't simply you know make a ton of money and then have it robbed from him, or there there couldn't be mechanical problems to face every every. I'm not I'm not explaining this well, but, but there had to be we, a moral we, component. There had to be a fundamental character issue or flaw, if you will, that Walter White possessed so that the the show did not become mechanical or schematic in that okay this week I've, I'm eighty thousand dollars closer to my goal next week I'll be forty thousand dollars away from it three episodes from now we'll have somebody rob Walt so he has to go back to square one and keep cooking meth we realized some get some gut level and it was kinda scary when we did it in that episode uh, but we realized that it would be better in in the fourth episode of, of, of of the 62 that someone in deus ex machina fashion comes to Walt and says some rich, these, the, the Gretchen and Elliot, the rich folks who he had known since college, come to him and say we've heard about your cancer, it's terrible news, what can we do to help, we're going to pay for the best treatment, we're going to give you a job, no strings attached. In deus ex machina fashion they show up and they offer him salvation and at the end of that hour of TV he says thanks but no thanks and he goes to Jesse Pinkman who he's on the outs with and he says let's cook mm -hmm. and that was probably the proudest moment character wise because at that moment it ceased to become a potentially very schematic and mechanical show and it became a show about a guy he became so much more instantly interesting that he would do something like that 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 self-destructive that prideful and flawed, you know, that's like the worst decision he could have made and yet the most interesting. So that was probably the proudest moment in the, in the certainly in the early going. And the thing that allowed the show to really cook, cook with gas after that, as it were, so. Because then all the complications became generated from within him and not due to circumstance. Yeah, it just, the characters who are the 
engineers of their own problems are more interesting than people who are put upon by I mean they both characters both situations work dramatically speaking but to me Walter White became so much more interesting when he stopped being a victim of the universe and he became a victim of himself and the truth is in hindsight he was always a victim of himself he says in that first clip you showed you know I'm, I never get to make my own decisions life has made decisions for me there are many things that re are revealed about him in subsequent episodes that put the lie to that you know, he is, he's the, engine, the architect of his own problems, uh, by and large, as most of us are, I think, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, not always. Uh, a lot of people were born behind the eight ball, you know, and uh, have it really tough. But a lot of the problems we have are of our own making. So I speak personally. So, you know. No, I think that that's, I think you just brilliantly encapsulated the, the change in the trajectory and what, what elevates Breaking Bad above above other shows and what makes it so compelling oh, at, thank at you. that moment. So, um, and that's a hard thing to articulate, even when it's your own material, so especially when it's your own material sometimes. It's hard to do that. So thank you so much for, for being able to give us these, these pearls that we're able to distill, because people watch it and watch it and watch it and talk about it. And yet that's more, to me, more insightful, what you just said, than all the analysis that I read online you know, as I'm, I'm glad it is. I, I, I got to say though, sometimes you you can't speak to your own show. Ver I, I very often I had, I had six years to think about it, but there were times there where I I personally couldn't see the forest for the trees, and and people would tell me things about my own show that I was incapable at that moment in time of of grasping. So and do you listen to them? <laughs> Not on the internet. I, I would never. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I personally never go on the internet right. for. For, for that kind of stuff, or I never, not for Breaking Bad or, or looking, I never Google the right. stuff that I'm working on, but I would hear anecdotally from, I would hear enough anecdotally just right. with folks on the street that, I, that I, 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 I got the gist of it just from running into, running into fans and, and friends and family and whatnot who offered me their thoughts. All right, well, I know people are chomping at the bit for questions, so we're going to open it up now. Uh, I'm just going to go as I see people right here, this gentleman. So, when you were first getting excited about this idea and, and started writing it, um, obviously you couldn't have, in your wild, I, you know, dreamed that it would have the success that it did, or that it would be as critically so satisfying as it was. But when you do get excited at first about a project and you're going into it, of course you're, you know, fantasizing that it's going to be amazing, and you're hoping otherwise you can't get that. Maybe I'm just projecting, but you can't get that excited about it. So you're right. You're on this kind of victory tour. <laughs> you know, everybody loves this. So many people love the show, and you're and you're going through this. How has it been different to sort of have that actually happen to you than to what you sort of when you were fantasizing about, like how you know the a show taking off like this? Uh, it's it's a good question. It's uh, I hope I have a a good enough answer. I I because I have thought about it a lot. I'm not used to success. I've, I've, this show has been successful for a while now, so I've had a little more practice at responding to folks saying, I really like the show, which is, which is helpful. But it, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer it. I, I was very excited at the prospect of this show. And as you just said, regardless of that enthusiasm I had for this idea back in the, at its, at its genesis, I was not thinking in terms of, sitting here in front of you folks tonight and having won an Emmy and all that. I, I didn't dream that big, but what I did have was enthusiasm for the idea. It was, it was enthusiasm that for me was, was a, bit, a bit outsized. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was appropriate to, uh, I'm not doing a good job explaining this. I really love the, the best way I can say it is as simply as possible, I really love the idea so much to the, I loved it to the point that I didn't, poke too many holes at in it in the early going. I say that because I typically do that. I typically am very somewhat self-censoring and self-critical to, you know, I'll come up with an idea, hey, that's kind of cool, and then I'll start to think of all the reasons why I shouldn't do it. And this one was the rare idea, and I'm not even 100%, I guess I am, kind of, I think I kind of know why, because I realized a lot of ways Walter White was me in the early going, and that's why I found him interesting. I don't mean Heisenberg, but I mean the, ori the original Walter White. I think uh, deconstructing it, reverse engineering it, I think I found this guy very interesting. 
I was very enthusiastic about writing about him and learning about him to the point that I didn't do the typical self-censoring that I typically do. And I, I didn't think too hard about, hey, I'm going to go in and pitch the head of Sony. And I think he's going to like it. I didn't say to myself, boy, there's a hundred reasons why he won't like this. I just sort of went forward with courage, which was somewhat uncharacteristic of me. Uh, but I was not, I was thinking in terms of, I'm enthusiastic because I got to have a lot of fun with this. I wasn't thinking in terms of, ooh, the world's going to love this and, and I, it will pay many dividends in many ways. I, I, I couldn't think that far ahead. I don't think it's healthy to think that far ahead, not for me anyway. But if you can be enthusiastic about your work to the point that you stop picking at scabs, as it were, poking holes at critically, unnecessarily, past a certain point, that's the best way to approach it and not think too much about monetary gain or critical acclaim or any of that, but just think in terms of the satisfaction of writing it that you can derive. That This was the rare moment for me where, where I felt that. Okay, I, I know there's a bunch of hands. I'm gonna, I saw this gentleman next. Um, and if you could keep your questions short, too, because I want to get to you know as many people as we can. Vince has a plane that he has to catch after this, so he is going to have to leave quickly at well, the tomorrow end. tomorrow morning. But, um, yeah, but, but early, <laughs> early, early. I've I got to go home and pack. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. So I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yes, thank right you. Here. I appreciate it. You talked about ending the show and wanting to end on a peak. At what point did you decide it's time, and how did you deal with the pressures that I'm sure came from outside saying, no? Don't, don't end it yet, just keep going. And, and contractually, did you just have the authority to say, no, we're, we're end it? Um, contractually, it's not that I had authority or a lack of authority. It was just, it was a very, it was a very supportive process uh, on the part of AMC and Sony. They were very good to me. And, and the actors are very good and supportive. Uh, Brian Cranston said to me, you sure you want to do this? We're having, we're having fun and we're really making good work here. And I explained to him the reasons why I wanted to end it. Pretty much what I've, what I said to you guys in the sense of I, I said to Brian, I don't want to end this. This is the most sat satisfying and fulfilling job I've ever had. It probably always will be thus. It'll, it'll always be the best job I've ever had. Always, very likely. I can't even imagine a better job. But I want to. It's better for all of us to end it. You know, it's better to leave the party with people saying, "Don't go," than than people saying, "Oh God, take the lampshade off your head." You know. <laughs> And uh, so, so, and he understood that, and, and, and AMC and Sony uh, understood it as well. Uh, Sony in particular, uh, which I understand completely, they, they were finally, they, they were very understanding about it because they were finally getting to the point, as the owners of the, the show, not the broadcaster, but the owners of the show, they were finally getting to the point where this show that it had been bleeding red was, was beginning to get into the black. And they said, oh my God, can we please go longer? And I s explained to them my thought process and they, they didn't love it, but, they were, they, but they, were, they were cool about it. And they said, all right, well, we get it. And um, so that was, uh, and when we came to that thought, it was, uh, as, as season three rolled into season four, season four rolled into season five, uh, more and more I felt this, the stirrings of, you know, I don't know exactly when it should end, but I know it's, it shouldn't be that long from now. It was very hard to figure out the exact time it should end. My writers and I talked about it for hours and hours trying to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, right over here. Yeah. Hi. The uh, clip you were talking about, or the episode Gray Matter, you were talking about the Davis Six smashing up. Yeah. That was the episode that made me go to start telling everyone I knew, you've got to watch Breaking Bad. Oh, cool. Uh, because most shows, uh, kind of display the character through conflict. And this was the first time I rem remember thinking, oh, he's getting exactly what he wants, and that's how he's displaying character. And it seemed like throughout the whole run of the show, Walter always got what he wanted, and that was always more interesting than him, his conflict. Can Good. Talk to the that's very well put, and that's, that's, one, of those, that's very one of those moments where I, I don't know that I could have said it that well. That sometimes you, you, don't, you don't see the forest for the trees. But I think you're right, and, and I guess the best short answer, pithy answer to that, although true nonetheless, is, is that I, I've watched a lot of TV, I've watched a lot of movies, uh, not read quite as many books as I should have, but I've watched a lot of TV, and when in doubt, in the writer's room of Breaking Bad, we would say to ourselves, what haven't we seen before? What's the typical way to do it? 
That's why I kind of tell the story of the, the, the junkyard dog chasing Jesse. I'm like, I think back as I'm telling that story, thing. did we really think that was a good idea? <laughs> Even before we found out it cost $25,000? But, but our best days in the room and some of our best work derive from us saying to ourselves, what have we seen? What, what rough uh, analog can we think of to this scene in, in a, another episode of TV or another movie? What did they do? What do they typically do in that moment? How can we turn 180 degrees or 90 degrees off from that and do something that is less expected? When in doubt, that, was, that, that, that held us, that service well held us in good stead. So when you said, have we ever seen the lead in a show just stand there and watch a girl choke on her own vomit and yeah. die? Then we said, no, we've never seen that yeah. before. Yeah. Let's, let's have yeah. him do that because yeah. it's so loathsome. Well, it started, uh, it started a good example. Probably would try to do it in the pilot as well, but the, the two-parter, that the second and third episode of the series, Walt has the guy chained in the basement with a bike with a motorcycle lock. And I had seen that episode, that movie ending a hundred times where the good guy you know, don't kill the bad guy. You know, don't. You're better than that. Okay, you're right. And then, and then the uh, the subset of that is always then the bad guy somehow grabs the gun, and then the good guy shoots him because he has to in that final moment. You know, that always that thing about you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. The good guy is not going to kill the bad guy because he's the good guy, but the bad guy will thus force him to kill him. So you get that visceral yay, <laughs> and and so we figured, well, what haven't we seen? The good guy just choking the fuck out of some guy because, <laughs> because he's, oh, we, we, we tempered it a bit by, by having Walt realize that the guy had the broken bit of, of plate, but uh, we tempered it that much. But, yeah, it's, you know, anyway. It's just a couple more because I, I know that we're running late. Uh, this gentleman here in the hat, I know you've had your hand up for a while. Yes, you, sir. Now that you've had a few weeks since the end, this brilliant show is amazing. Oh, Thank you. Have you ever woken up at 4 a.m. and gone, hmm, maybe Walt should end up in Belize? <laughs> I haven't yet. I, I got to tell you, I had a great many sleepless nights before the final episodes aired, or, or rather before we, uh, yeah, actually all the way through, but uh, <laughs> sp specifically before we broke the final episodes. Once I got to the set of the last episode, we were shooting it. Uh, I started to feel more at ease with it or more comfortable with the ideas of, that we had come up with but but there were a great many nights in the past year year and a half where where I, I feared that I would do exactly that I'd wake up after the show, the last episode aired and say oh my god now I know what we should have done <laughs> I haven't yet doesn't mean it won't happen <laughs> but uh, but it I found it works both ways I was talking about home fries earlier I know there's something wrong with the end of home fries but in the last 25 years <laughs> no 15 years 15 years, I haven't, uh, whatever the hell it is, 15 years, I haven't quite figured it out. So, I don't know. It, it, it probably is best not to torture oneself. <laughs> and, uh, okay, uh, just, uh, just a couple yeah, more. Yeah, I felt like it, yeah. Th this woman right here. What were some of the ideas for the series finale that you guys talked about and said, Gosh, you got any good ones? Walt wake up in, in the bedroom and Malcolm in the middle and realize that Breaking Bad was just one big long dream. Maybe. <laughs> Did anybody suggest that? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> any new heart fans? There? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of... Uh, Skylar was going to kill herself at one point because she just couldn't live with, with uh, her, her, uh, her shared guilt in this. They were going to run off together. We knew there was one point we talked about, uh, you know, instead of that, that moment with the knife in the third to last episode, does, is there a way that, that Walt can get his family on the run with him? And we quickly realized that there's just no way Junior's going to go. And you're not going to make a, a, an adult sized, even if he's your son, you're not going to get Junior into the car. You just not, it's not going to happen. But maybe would Skyler go and then and then think just be in this unbelievably dark place and they're in a Motel 6 somewhere and he's knocking on the bathroom door and the blood is, the bloody tub water's coming out underneath. We talked about all those kind of things. We, we uh, I'm trying to think what else we talked about. Prison, there was going to be the Walt, we're going to use the M60 for Walt to break into prison or, or, or a prison bus to save Jesse or to kill the Nazis or both. Because we thought, what do you use an M60 machine gun for? That's you got to have a major 
you don't you don't go hunting rabbits with that. You, you got to have a reason to have a, that big and uh, powerful a machine gun. So uh, stuff like that. But uh, I don't remember. There was not there was not one alternate contender that we thought, oh, this is really good. Should it be this? Should it be that? Should it be this? It, we just would throw lots of stuff at the wall until something stuck. So I don't remember anything that we were too had our hearts set on other than what we wound up with. Uh, the woman at the back here. Hi. Uh, I was, hi. Okay. Um, I was curious if you have found through the body of your writing, even early on as a teenager, any recurring themes? And if so, if you would share with us that, you know, maybe some inciting moments in your own life that you see there's a, a recurring theme and, and what from your life would feed it? That's a good question. I, I, I not to pass the buck, but I, I really, um, uh, if there are, I don't know that I'm the best person to identify them. That may be that that forest for the trees thing that I spoke of. But uh, I can tell you that in the early days of writing movie scripts, I wrote a lot of brothers. I wrote, wrote a lot of uh, tension between brothers, and I have a brother, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, who's a, four years younger than me, and maybe I was. Although we get along fine now, uh, and, and, and you know, I, we, there was a time there where maybe we didn't get along as well. So I wrote a lot of brother-type stories. Uh, Wilder Napalm and uh, Home Fries and Home Fries. Fries both had that element. Uh, prodigal brother coming back. Well, and actually, Wilder Napalm has sort of a prodigal feel to it. And then the anyway, um, uh, it seems to me in hindsight that Breaking Bad is about fear, fear of living. Uh, fear of uh, the fears we that, that that cripple us that tend to cripple us and and in and Walter White his super he's got a couple superpowers his ability to lie his ability to cook meth but what one superpower is his ability to uh, his fearlessness which is at odds he was for 50 years of his life he's very fearful of everything he says that in one particular episode he gets this cancer diagnosis and suddenly he is uh, he is no longer fearful and that's uh, which I find interesting to examine. I guess I found that interesting to examine because I, I, I so, that's so not my experience that it was fun to write about someone who, who saw the world that way. But, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, this gentleman right here. You know, apart from the characters and the story which are so compelling, I mean, what I admire uh, a lot about the show is the, is the tone and that you found such an interesting tone that shifts all the time. You mentioned Kubrick. I wondered uh, who I think is also really a master of that. I, I wondered if there were uh, other influences for you in, in getting the tone right for it. Kubrick's a huge influence. Uh, I, love, uh, I love the Coen brothers. I love that they can mix uh, the darkest of dark moments with the most absurd comedic moments uh, or, or humorous moments. Uh, I don't know that this uh, illuminates what you just said, but I, I can tell you that The Godfather parts one and two were, were huge influences on, on Breaking Bad. We would, we would always say, what, what would The Godfather do, you know, in the, or, or rather, what would Francis Ford uh, Coppola do, you know, in the writer's room? Uh, although that doesn't really, I guess there's some because those movies, there's not a, there's not a whole lot of humor in, in those two movies, but uh, a little bit. There's a, no, but I mean, I'm thinking there's some, there's some. Leave uh, the gun, take the cannoli. Leave the know. gun, take the cannoli. Yeah, uh, but um, but I, I I felt uh, uh, there was a there was a, a a sister show to the X Files called Millennium, that was a show about a, a profiler for for the FBI who uh, sought serial killers. And it was, a, and I, I didn't write for it, but I, I appreciated it as a fan. And I was there, I, you know, I knew all the writers on it, go steal food from their kitchen and their trailer in the Fox lot and, and hang out with those guys. And I really was a fan of that show. Uh, and it was a very dark show. And I learned something from, from being uh, a close by observer to that series, which was a show that dark, that unrelentingly dark, needs to be leavened with a little bit of humor. If, if it isn't, people are just, it's, even if they like it, at a certain point they're going to be like, it's just so unrelentingly dark, I can't take it anymore. And I think that might have been what happened with Millennium. Uh, as good in quality, uh, as good a show as it was, as, as, as 
as, as quality a product as it was. And I figured early on with Breaking Bad, we have to put as much legitimate humor into this thing as possible. Otherwise, no one's going to want to watch this thing. No one's going to want to sit through it. And therefore, we, you know, we'd, we'd love to stretch the, t or, or, or change up the, change up the, you know, shift gears there ton tonally, uh, wh while keeping it as real as possible. It had to be real. It couldn't be humor derived from, if, if the humor was not derived from the actual situation at hand, if it didn't feel earned or real or authentic, then the, we wouldn't have done it. But, uh, but we tried to get as much as we could in there, for sure. Okay, uh, this lady right here, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. I was curious, um, do you have any idea what's next for you? Is there something that you really, really want to do in the future? Well, we're going to, uh, Peter Gould, who's a, a writer and producer on, on, on Breaking Bad, uh, who's an excellent uh, writer and producer and director, uh, who actually created the character Saul Goodman. He and I are going to, gonna, uh, we're, uh, we're going to work on a spin-off series, and Melissa here is going to work on a spin-off, and Gordon here, my, my assistant Gordon, uh, is going to be a writer on Saul Goodman, on Better Call Saul. All yeah, right. So he's going to be, uh, so we're going to be doing that, and that's going to be a lot of fun, uh, I, I hope. I mean, it'll be fun for us, I hope for viewers as well. It'll. I'd like to do, fe I've never directed a feature. I've written a couple that that uh, were not entirely satisfying to me uh, for various reasons, a lot of which were my fault for not nailing the ending, uh, a couple times at least. I, I, I'd like to direct a feature that I wrote. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head what that would be, but I'd like to do that before I'm, before I'm done because uh, I love movies. But having said that, I don't want to be too greedy because I, I, TV has been so good to me for a lot of reasons. But most important reason, it's been so creatively satisfying that, that it makes me think, why would you want to go do a movie? But then again, just because I haven't done one. I mean, directing-wise. So, uh, yeah, that'd be nice. I don't know what it will be if, if I can get that going. But, but uh, I don't have any uh, immediate plan for that. Well, on, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank you for coming in tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.